John. John Whitman in the house from Cushman Wakefield. This is our very first video podcast. Um, took someone that was familiar to me, so to make it easy, right? Uh, we're calling it Shop Talk, Lang Hammer Shop Talk. Really the goal of Shop Talk, John, as we move forward uh, with you and with other guests is to learn more about you know, who's in commercial real estate and what they're doing and how yeah. they got there, all those things. So welcome to Shop Talk, John. Hey man, thanks for having me. We're really excited for you to be here. Um, and I mean that, I don't mean this, we're not excited, we're excited. Uh, so just kind of diving right into, uh, you know, the guts of what makes up John Whitman. <laughs> it's a deep question, I know. As it pertains to commercial real estate, talk about where you started yep. in the industry. Um, and then we'll lead that into kind of what you're doing now and maybe out there somewhere in the uh, social media universe, people will, you know, kind of come to a greater understanding of some of the things that maybe you're faced with, some sure. of the challenges, some of the pitfalls, kind of thing. So, yeah. talk about John Whitman, uh, where you started uh, in commercial real estate. So, you you actually came to commercial real estate from outside the industry you did many many moons ago, yeah. and you landed at. Reese Porter. Reese Porter. Paul Porter. God bless his soul. God bless his soul. Yeah. Great man. Yeah. Uh, so talk a little bit about how you got to Reese Porter and then where that led you. Sure. So relationship with Paul Borg dated back to where I grew up, McShane, Wisconsin, uh, as a caddy, uh, Bigfoot Country Club. Um, got to know Paul and a lot of his friends and cronies pretty good. Um, when I had that uh, opportunity and was in the insurance business actually originally, um, I got... Um, uh, wanted to take a look at doing something besides working in the insurance business and Paul was looking for somebody who could do business development could do some marketing and knew uh, a little bit about uh, you know a little bit about the business and frankly also somebody he liked to play off with so uh, it was kind of the uh, perfect kind of yeah, perfect combo <laughs> for him um, and then once I, it was a very very short time I jumped into the business and I met some great people like yourself and uh, Lauren Bagel and uh, uh, Lauren Berger Schwartz uh, shout out to the Lawrence yeah the Lawrence um, and, um, and and quickly learned that it was a it was, it was a great business it, I love the physical nature of it that you're actually constructing something you're building something uh, hopefully help and improve you know the way that people work people you know people interact and so just you know immediately fell in love with it and then uh, one of the things that was the biggest impact to me was I got involved with Cornet um, right out of the bag uh, so I started in January by April I went to my first luncheon I always talk about I didn't know anybody so I stood in the back and looked for people who also looked like they didn't know anybody and just you know started networking my way around uh, better a little less than a year later I was uh, invited to the board to start a young leaders program and that really was the springboard for so many different aspects of my career uh, a lot of the people that I met through that and in fact my now wife um, <clears throat> were, were direct relation um, to that young leader program and uh, so you know give a lot of props and a lot of appreciation to that association it's, it's had a huge impact on my career now uh, after uh, Reese Borg uh, had a short stint with a, uh, a moving company that's uh, defunct, no longer uh, in the marketplace, which was also interesting. Where I got to meet some folks from, uh, got to meet some folks from around the country, and uh, continue to kind of build out my network. And uh, it became clear to me that uh, more than, more uh, that I saw my opportunity was is to build relationships with people. And as a contractor, um, you're at one kind of level in the in the pyramid of doing deals. Uh, as a mover, uh, where I was, uh, <laughs> you were uh, at the absolute end of the <laughs> spectrum or the bottom of the pyramid because uh, you were the last, uh, you know, last uh, kind of cog in doing a deal or getting a project done. Yeah, of course. Um, so that really gave me an opportunity to really kind of network with everyone uh, above me. So furniture people, carpet people. Uh, project managers, uh, you, you know, you name it, brokers, you know, the whole thing. Um, so it gave me kind of a unique perspective to kind of look from the bottom up. And uh, at that point, I was kind of like, I realized I didn't want to be at the bottom anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wanted to, uh, I wanted to, you know, take what I'd learned so far and then start to be able to influence, um, have some influence, um, try to figure out how to, you know, get involved with deals and things like that. Mm -hmm. And then randomly, I was, again, through a relationship with Cornet, I was asked if I knew anything about facility management. And I said, like, IFMA? I said, I don't even know what that means. 
Um, and they said, no, not, not exactly. Uh, they said, uh, no, Does anybody know what that means, really? <laughs> yeah. They said, no, this is more about, you know, operating facilities and big corporates who have big staff that do things that uh, they all kind of throw in a bucket of, uh, they call facility management. And so uh, I was offered a job with a company at the time. It was called UGL Services. Um, it was owned by an Australian company. It was kind of a weird deal. Really kind of worked in Chicago, reported essentially into Boston, uh, but worked with a great group of guys. Uh, I had a great boss at the time. And um, we were primarily, what we were more focused on is, you know, is uh, janitorial services, engineering services, mm -hmm. you know, kind of the outsourcing of, of those functions. And uh, lo and behold, I landed my first, uh, my first customer, which was uh, the Lincoln Park Zoo. Oh, um, which I got a lot of fun made of. We said, you're in the largest corporate uh, headquarters market in the world and your first client's a zoo. Yeah, uh, yeah but, a free uh, zoo. <laughs> a free zoo, nonetheless. <laughs> uh, but that was an interesting experience, too. Get to go down to local 399 and meet with the, you know, hot head honchos of the, of the union and stuff like that. Sure. So, interesting learning experience of, of really what, what uh, is, is in, in facility management, that's how the business is really a people business. It's uh, outsourcing of people. Yeah. Um, it's not about necessarily the deal or the dollar or things like that. It's really about making sure you got the right people and things like that, putting the right programs together. So anyway, um, from that, I stuck with the company. I moved into a corporate services role. Uh, about that time, they'd gone through some rebranding and it was now DTZ. Mm -hmm. And then uh, uh, that company, which was owned, again, like I said, by the Australian company, was sold to a private equity group and it became uh, owned by a group out of Dallas. And uh, they bought Cassie Turley and then bought Cushman Wakefield and then rebranded the whole thing Cushman Wakefield. So the entire time you're basically working for Cushman and you didn't know it. Yeah, basically. That's <laughs> where you're going to end up. Right? Yeah, exactly. And I get questions asked all the time, like, you keep switching jobs. I said, no, they just keep changing the name on me. Right. And uh, so I was in that corporate services role for a bit. It wasn't a really good fit for me. Um, that's a job um, that's really about pushing paper. Mm -hmm. RFP shows up, you yeah. chase down the paper, you, you know, respond to these sort of things, do presentations, stuff like that. And it didn't, uh, it wasn't a good fit uh, for what I wanted to do and, and became pretty clear to me that the, that was, you know, not a role where I could influence or use my relationships. It was just literally, you know, responding, you know, writing things and responses and things like that. So. I uh, kind of started getting a feeling at that time that, you know, I've been, you know, knew enough about brokerage to think that it was something I should do, but it's a scary thing to jump off a cliff and, you know, not have a safety net, you know, go for it, getting a salary and benefits and bonus and those sort of things. And yeah. I even had, one time I even had a company car um, to, you know, basically eating what you kill and yeah. you know, making only what, whatever comes in. Um, so that was, you know, a scary proposition when you're in your 30s and 40s. Um, your skill set, John, I think is interesting. It's interesting from a commercial real estate perspective, certainly, but from the perspective of how deals get done. Mm -hmm. You've mentioned the word relationship about 30 different times in the first five minutes since you've been talking. <laughs> yeah. So you came into the industry because of a relationship. Yeah. So obviously, yeah. out of the gate, you understood kind of what made things tick, right? Yeah. So business development obviously is a natural progression yeah. for you. So knowing that so much of the trajectory of, you know, John Whitman and the brand <laughs> is John Whitman, but so much of the trajectory of John has been about relationships and building relationships. And I would say, you know, I'm great at making friends. I'm a professional friend maker. <laughs> sure. You know, I think yeah. that uh, you and I are very much like-minded that way and how yeah. we connect people to people. Yeah. So talk a little bit about maybe how unique your situation is now where you're able to be an influencer and capitalize on the relationships that you've built now over the last yeah. 15 years. Maybe less, maybe more. Yeah, it's you're, close not to that. That, you're not that old, Jack. Yeah, it's close to that. It's getting close to that, which is crazy. Um, yeah, so I mean, you, you just articulated as it, and it's, uh, you know, a little bit of it's kind of that I got a guy mentality. Of course. Um, but in our case, it's it's about having uh, the right people in the right places to be able to put deals together. And truthfully, um, over my career, they've just gotten to be, um, you know, they've just kind of slowly built and grown and become more and more complex. So you've, you've now transitioned into being a commercial real estate broker. Mm -hmm. And when you, when you decided, I'm going to take this test, 
and many I, times. Well, you said it. I, I know it's good for you. When you took that test three times, John, uh, and you decided that you know the, the different avenues that you could go down, how did you come to the conclusion that I want to work more on the industrial side of the business versus a tenant rep, yeah. property manager, owner rep type scenario? Well, it's two things really is, is that one is, is that I saw the opportunity within my company and even within the business. Um, I had a short stint where I worked in our, what we call our industrial platform. And knowing the folks that were in there, uh, knowing their skill sets and things like that, I saw an opportunity. Um, and I saw an opportunity to essentially build exactly what our team does now, which is to uh, work as what we call tenant rep or multi-market account management um, from a broker perspective. So essentially, we work with uh, what we say, if you've never heard of the company, you don't know what they make, uh, mid-cap type companies um, that have anywhere from our smallest customer has five locations to our largest customer has 650 locations. And it's doing every aspect of real estate because most of those companies don't have a real estate department. They've got a guy. Uh, right, they got a guy right. who's probably finance or legal or risk. Yeah, you know, so he's <laughs> completely overwhelmed with what he's doing anyway. Yeah, and yeah. so just they need they need help. And um, and then the key thing is is that you know through this um, kind of education learned that you know real estate's done on a very local level, um, and you have to have great people in local markets to be able to be successful. Um, listen, there, there's guys that would sit here and you know, tell you, dude, hey, listen, I'm the greatest broker in history and I do all my own deals and I fly all over the country and I go to marketplaces. To us, that's incredibly inefficient right. um, because we have great people in these marketplaces. The combination of the Cassie Turley, Cushman, Wakefield, and these sort of things, um, it was done with intent of having some of the best people in the marketplaces, and it's true. Um, Are you able to drive those opportunities across the multi-market platform? Yeah. From here, yes, we can do it from anywhere. I mean, it, you know, it was just done with one of our largest customers, which is Duke Energy. Uh, they're based in Charlotte. Um, they're more than a decade contracted customer with us uh, to do transaction management. And frankly, we're not even doing really any work for them in Charlotte. Uh, we're doing work in Cincinnati, Indiana, Tampa, you know, all over the place. Um, and I heard it best when we were meeting with a customer recently, and they're they're a big, big Fortune 50 company, and their entire real estate department said we're virtual. Because we said, well, we have to have people you know, in your marketplace. They said, well, I really work out of my house. Um, you know, I manage 300 buildings, and I work out of my house. Right. Um, because the nature of what it is, is 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 now with the technologies we have, you know, be it drone videos, be it you know those sort of things, you can get so much. You know, even Google Earth. I mean, you sure. can size up a building, look at HVAC unit. I mean, you can do just about everything you can. You need it from your you know from your desktop. Um, so it's, it really doesn't require you to be in any one location. And frankly, we manage 32 different customers and we do very little work in Chicago. Um, we right. do a handful of jobs here every year. Um, so, so truly, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's managing global business, and, but you can do it from anywhere. Talk about the culture of Cushman and Wakefield, because I know that Cushman's a pretty progressive company. Um, obviously, by the way that they have uh, grown and merged and grown yeah. and acquired and been acquired. It takes direction from the top and kind of filters down. So how is the company culture today, even versus before, like sure. before you were officially Kusher, because sure. I'm sure that it, it's evolved, right? Yeah. And they want you and encourage you to do and be that virtual you know, type of a group to service your clients. Yeah. Um, you know, I know that the, the the way that we work here at LCI, I mean, you're constantly moving and constantly on the go, mm -hmm. right? So I would have to assume a lot of your work gets done in a similar fashion. Sure. I, mean, I, I call you the windshield guy, <laughs> constantly driving. So yeah, talk a little bit about the culture and how how it how it has either helped you or or maybe hurt mm -hmm. hurt you in the process of trying to build this organization within organization. Sure, yeah, it, it, it's, it's still evolving. Um, every day it's evolving. <clears throat> you know, we, um, it, as you described, it's mashing together a bunch of different styles of work and things like that. Yeah. And I'd say in particular, you know, we, we kind of, you know, there's the Equus name that's out there and, you know, there's still a lot of that and that was a really entrepreneurial 
um, organization. Right. Yeah, it was a small boutique brokerage firm, and you, you you said you had an office in 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 Phoenix, and it was literally a guy, uh, one guy. Um, you didn't have 140 people like you now. You know, really, actually, an office uh, there and things like that. So it's kind of it's it's that side of it, really, from an entrepreneurial side. And then I'd say more on the Cushman side. Cushman was very much more very New York centric, uh, very buttoned up. Uh, very much more of kind of perceived of my perception of them in the marketplace was more of a consultative yeah. um, kind of thing. wasn't hardcore or anything. It was right. just you know consultative, very yeah. high level. You know, kind of won the big deals that sort of stuff. Um, and I think that now you're seeing that culture blend together. Um, just in, in, in particular of, of people in the office, Cushman had very much a FaceTime. You're in the office every day. Like, really? Yeah, yeah. Which is which is just weird. And I still run into it because I'm in the office. I sit in Rosemont if I sit anywhere. Um, you know, one day, two days a month maybe. And every time I'm in there, I kid you not, probably no less than a dozen people. Oh, hey, good to see you. Hey, where you been? Where? You know, I'm like, ah, ah, I'm, what do you mean? I can imagine. I can imagine like knowing knowing a little bit more about your 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 jobs and where you've been, like coming from like this completely autonomous. Yeah. You know, I'm gonna do what I want to do when I want to do it, and you'll see the results, yeah. and everybody will be happy to come into. If it if it truly was like that hardcore, like be seen yeah. mentality, yeah, yeah you you a flounder a bit there, John. <laughs> yeah, it's I know just, I would too. But yeah, you know, I but it's just, yeah, I don't know. It's fascinating to me. I've always been a strong believer of you know, go wherever you gotta do to get to get your work done. Sure. You know, if that's to sit down in a Starbucks and work for a couple hours, because that's where you focus best. Go, you know, go do that. Right. Um, so, like I said, it's, it's been interesting evolution for me to be around it. Um, but I think, you know, our group in particular, so we, there's four of us now, we're expanding, we're adding another resource, a couple more resources over the next couple of months. John Tyree, did you hear that? John Tyree. <laughs> <laughs> We've already hired. Um, but um, just based on the volume that we have, and we want to have capacity to add more. Yeah. Um, so, um, and do some different stuff than we've, we've typically done. Um, so, you know, some of the people are just comfortable. Like we've got a couple of people that live downtown, and so they want to work downtown, so they work downtown. Sure. Uh, we got a great office down there. Um, the guy, a little senior guy, Tim, who I work with, he's more of a suburban guy, so if he's anywhere in the office, he's he's here. But he's working more from home. In fact, he just asked me about if it, you know his wife, after this terrible winter, wanted to you know accelerate their plans to get down south. So he asked me about working out of Tampa. Uh, that would be horrible in the wintertime? Yeah, I'm like, as long as you don't mind us coming down you know, twice a week to visit, uh, we'll be fine. Yeah, right. Um, but in fact, we were having this conversation, what's funny about it, and this is more about just, I guess, work styles than it is anything. We're having this conversation as I'm on my Skype phone when I'm in Mexico for spring break last week. Nice. So, I said, so I said to him, I said, Tim, I'm talking to you on my Skype phone from Mexico, so we're good. You want to go to Tampa? I think we're, I think. <laughs> and here I was texting you, yeah. like, hey, John, you want to come and do our, our video podcast? Absolutely. You're like, dude, I'm on the beach. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. That's outstanding. Yeah. So. so it becomes more virtual. More virtual. Yeah, and listen, um, again, like I said, so much of what we do is more about process and follow up and just being diligent about getting things done. Sure. Um, and, and that's, I think, one of the things that differentiates us and makes us successful is, is that we have a process um, to be able to do these things. Um, and really, it's it's more about making sure that things that, you know, train just keeps kind of moving down the track for these. And listen, we just got a new customer kind of brought to us from an internal group. And uh, I mean, within a week, uh, we're involved in five different deals in five different parts of the country, a couple of sales, a couple of leases. And in fact, I even got an email from the uh, real estate director and she asked if I could be on a call because she couldn't be on it. So like that level of trust built that fast. Yeah. She's like, you got this covered for me? I'm, I'm not available. Like I'm on a plane, you know? Like, yeah. Sure. Yeah. We got that covered for you. I would have to imagine a lot of it is in how you, in how you communicate to the client, right? Yeah. Yeah. And you know, it's not like your word is law, but yeah. you know a, a tremendous amount about what kind of needs to happen transactionally. Sure. So let's let's dial it back. Mm -hmm. let's, let's talk about uh, commercial real estate broker. Because mm -hmm. so I think this is really interesting. When in the marketplace you say, Oh I am a commercial real estate broker, I always look, talk about the you know the, the three minute elevator speech. Right? Mm -hmm. Now, my background, as you know, is uh, contract furniture. Right. I used to struggle a lot with with that elevator speech for contract furniture because it's not like you're going to, uh, you know, Art Van and you say, 
I love that couch. I'm buying that couch in that color. When do I get it? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Here's my three thousand dollars. When do I get my couch? Right. So you got the elevators. Oh, what do you do for a living? Oh, I, you know, I work for a contract furniture dealership. Oh, that's interesting. What does that mean? <laughs> well, and then it's a very long, yeah, long kind of story or can be. Yeah. Because there's nothing. I don't. It, it's it's not as easy as like I work at Arcane Furniture. Ah, oh, I get that. Right. Yeah. So you know, people ask now, what do you do? I work for you know general contract. Yeah. I think associated uh, they associate that immediately with how you build things. Yeah. Okay. Hammers, nails, wood, brick. The, the, yeah, I get that. I can, I can quantify that in my, in my brain in that three minutes and say that guy can build it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So a commercial real estate broker, right? Yeah. In your three-minute elevator speech, and this is more for the layman that may may click on this and go, oh, hey, I know Wickman. What does he do? What? What does that guy? Yeah. Uh, commercial real estate broker. Yeah. Three-minute elevator speech. Okay. Yeah. I'll even break it down to 30 seconds. Uh, what we do is we help companies uh, with anything related to their real estate. Whether it be buy, lease, sell, evaluate, uh, whatever it happens to be. And that's as simple as it is. I know some guys make it over more complicated than that. Sure. Try to, sure. I mean, listen, that's it. We want to help companies. Uh, we want to help them be able to decide whether they're in the right location or not. Should they be in a lease building? Should they be in an own building? Right. And we, what we do is, is we truly uh, bring, uh, whether it be Cushman Resources or not Cushman Resources, we bring resources to the table to help them evaluate you know, any one of these things. Listen, I worked at a recycling company last year, and they recycle glass. And we spent six months, heads down, doing mapping employees, mapping customers, mapping right. rail lines, mapping waterways, you know, all these sort of things. I mean, like business case type stuff. Sure. Knowing dang well that there was probably never going to be a deal. <laughs> uh, but it was the right thing to do because they were a new customer and that sort of thing. And, and, and we've got the resources to be able to do that. Listen, I helped a friend of ours out whose brother runs a donut shop and nice. was thinking about Madison. So he wanted to see population and wanted to see where the other donut shops were in Madison. Sure, sure. Got you covered. No problem. Here. Well, I mean, and you have the, the ability and the resources to probably pull that stuff together pretty quickly. Yeah, that's that's the key, and that's one of the things I probably should have highlighted, you know, along with relationships, that really has become a differentiator for me and now by extension of me and the group is is, is responsiveness right because let's see kills man <laughs> well time does kill deals i have learned that the hard way in this uh -huh, uh, last yeah. uh, couple of years uh but but you know literally i mean it's one of the biggest frustrations that people hear you know oh hey i had this great initial conversation and this guy was going to do these five things and here we are a month later and i you know I haven't heard boo from the guy right so just you know being um, you know responsive, being quick to respond, and things like that, and being yeah. diligent. Even if you don't, even if the answer is I don't have an answer for you, sure. but I'm working on it. Yeah, answers, yeah, communication. So I'd say that's that's one of the things, and it just blows my mind every day because we see it all over our business. Um, people that just don't get that that's important to people. The lack of response. We see it on our side too. Um, you know whether it be you know architects or project managers on the client side or yeah. something from the building or subcontractors yeah. or even in-house when you know a lot of times I think that that when someone doesn't have an answer mm -hmm. they'd rather not say anything sure. other than, rather than say hey I don't have an answer right I'm still working out right you know I think you know from a client's perspective that that we appreciate it certainly yeah our entire world in the midst of project revolves around timeline mm -hmm. and it revolves around the schedule and how long is it going to take to get this one thing done so that we can move on to the next thing yep. to the next thing to the next thing so in terms of putting your deals together how do those timelines flow well it all flows downhill right um, so when you start that's called gravity dude yeah exactly <laughs> so you start these things off and you you know you got like an unlimited amount of time and you feel like it's gonna you know you can be a, no problem. We're going to deliver this. We're going to do that. I mean, I can tell you about a deal where we just got approval to move forward with in uh, just outside Elkhart, Indiana, yesterday. Wow. Um, Thriving metropolis, yeah. Elkhart. Wow. The uh, RV capital of the world. 
Uh, and um, you know, this guy, we've been talking with him for six months. Right. And six months ago, he was ready to go. Yeah, but the approvals take a long time. Sure. And we're talking seven million dollar deal. I mean, this is a big thing. It's going to be a big impact on their business. Um, and so, of course, you know, he's okay. Now we're ready to go. And he's like, but now we got to go really fast. Yeah. And you're like, oh, so all these timelines and everything you had, you know, compressed way down, which you know is an important thing, I think, for everybody. You know, because because then now we're looking at general contractors saying, okay, I know we talked originally about six months to do this, but can you do it in four? Of course. Um, you know, and so it's just everybody's timelines, you know, start to get crunched. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's more real on those conversations you can on the front end. Um, and, you know, I, it's a terrible expression to say, you know, if you set the bar low enough, you can walk across it. But, um, you know, just, you know, set these things out for, for realistic sure. um, time and budgets and all that sort of stuff. Because um, that, that's the way to, you know, continue to maintain customers and earn trust and things like that. And there's yeah. a lot of guys in our business that, you know, they promise the world and they, you know, just hope that they can deliver half of it. Um, well, there's plenty. I mean, there's plenty of hit and run. Yeah. types of scenarios yeah. uh, across the board. And that's not just a, a broker-centric type of a thing. I mean, it's hit and run okay. artists all over the industry, yeah. you know, kind of across the board. You mentioned, you mentioned um, you know, general contractors. And you say contracting, you know, my years per country. Sure. What has your experience has been like, um, just as, as your portfolio of business kind of spans across you know, the U.S. and mm -hmm. all these markets, you're dealing with a lot of different obstacles in terms of how to get these things to the finish line. Yep. And one of those has to be selections of GCs and architects sure. and project manager type groups that can run the projects for your clients. Mm -hmm. um, whether you're hands in, hands on, or hands off, doesn't, you know, you, you, you have some experience across the board in yeah. how those things get done. Now, I know Chicago is a completely unique market. Yeah in terms of the contractor's world and the broker's world mm -hmm. and the architect's world. How has your experience been a kind of across the board and then as you talk about it and we formulate mm -hmm. you know, where you are, bring it back to local here um, to maybe we can kind of compare and contrast. Yeah, so I mean, uh, one thing just to keep in mind because of how our model set up, where we work exclusively with local brokers uh, in every marketplace, um, I, I'm maybe not, and we're not, maybe sitting on top um, of a deal all the way through. I think we're <laughs> not recording. <laughs> Okay, so uh, when we when we uh, last left, uh, you were going to talk about a little bit about contracting, contracting across the board. And, yeah, you know, in that in that part of that conversation, you can probably include you know other service providers sure. and like just use it kind of as a broad stroke. Yeah, and then bring it back local. Yeah, sure. I, and like I said, I think that um, you know, because we we rely on local brokers to be our first line of defense mm -hmm. in each other marketplaces. Yeah. Um, we rely upon them to make sure they're lining up the right guys to get the deals and get these projects done. So you're always looking for them to say, "I got a guy." Right. I mean, sure. if if it's a, if it's a particular marketplace and I got a relationship with somebody, I want to have somebody included. Um, that's one thing. Yeah. Um, but really, the nature of the business that we do, the primary business we do, which is a lot of industrial warehouse kind of distribution type stuff, yeah. there's not a lot uh, from a contracting standpoint. Of course. Um, and a lot of times it's just landlord says, oh, you want two more dock doors? Well, my guy's going to you know, knock sure. those out and that'll be part of my agreement. And yeah. then, you know, I'm stuck with the building anyway, so yeah. I'd rather you know, take that liability on itself. Uh, but you know, in the larger cases, um, you know, there are some good firms out there that um, you know, we'll do some pretty cool, use some pretty cool technologies. Um, one in particular is out of um, Kansas City, and they've got a great tool that they've built that's based kind of on the Revit platform mm -hmm. that they can do um, kind of real time modeling along with costing to go along with that. Sure. So, let's say you want to build a 100,000 foot box, you want to see it in metal. Uh, okay, what's that going to cost us? 
you want to see it in you know tilt up walls. Mm -hmm. you know, let's show you what it's going to look like with tilt up walls and show you what it does, you know, impacts the cost and things like that. Yeah. And uh, so, so you know, th those things I think are cool. I think that um, being here in the Chicago market, just you know, the contracting world is, you know, it as better if not uh, better than most is, is that it's super competitive. Yeah. Um, it's super competitive in, in each in each kind of segment and class, right? Mm -hmm. So whether you're talking interiors or retail or you're talking, you know, industrial, you know, whatever it happens to be, you know, yeah. there's 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 generalists that you know kind of you, know, you guys can cover a little bit of everything. Yeah. Um, but there's you know specialty players and you know kind of everyone. Those little it always things. happens by default. Yeah. Though. It's, it's yeah. one of those things where, you know, you call me and you're looking at an industrial building. Mm -hmm. Hey, I need this done. Can you do it? Yeah. I mean, yeah, you know we can. Yeah. Um, you know, I was we always kind of look at ourselves and say like we can't try to be something we're not. Sure. Um, so I always put that caveat in there. Like this is not a core business. Right. You know, can you build a building out of the ground? Yeah, of course. And we have project managers and project teams here that have done that. Yeah. That have plenty of knowledge and how to get that accomplished within a, a time frame. Right. But it's not going to be what our core business is. Right. We get our fair shake at all of those. Sure. You know, cause, but again, it's not, you can't be yeah. something you're not. Yeah, and I think that that's uh, that's a lot, you know, to our philosophy. We're we're not low, as I said, we're not local brokers, and we're not, um, you know, the the high end, you know, folks. We're in the volume business, and we crank things out, and we pay local guys to do deals. You know, it's a uh, famous, you know, words of Bill Murray: "No job is too big, no fee is too, too big. big." I always look at it and say, when when, when people will call me yeah. and say, you know, hey, I've got I've got this project. And they'll they'll start to say, can you you know build a building out of the ground? Right? Yeah. I I'm usually oh yeah yeah of course of course yeah. yes yes sure. before they even complete the sentence right <laughs> of course say yes. yes we can why say no when it feels so, so good, good to say yes yeah. say yes yeah so being based here in Chicago uh, I know that you're also involved in a lot of other things mm -hmm. um, I've had the pleasure of uh, pleasure uh, uh, well. Co-hosting, it would be probably an insult to co-hosting, uh, but I've had the pleasure of helping, we'll say helping, with the largest, largest, still the largest, largest, pretty close, not the largest, golf close. outing in the commercial real estate industry, with the Cornette Golf Outing. It's certainly the best. I would agree with you there. I mean, the guys that put that together, they're a bangerang, man. <laughs> um, um, Cornet. Yep. You've been very involved in Cornet. Yep. You've had you've been a past president. Yep. You've been on boards and you served on committees and um, you know, my take on it is a little different than yours and you know, early in my career I went to a lot of Cornet meetings. Yep. Um, um, I, I think it's a great organization. We support it. LCI supports it as mm -hmm. do most of the sure. you know, commercial real estate world here. Talk about a little bit about um, because the, the, the whole conversation for you started with talking about a relationship. Mm -hmm. I had a relationship with Paul Bork mm -hmm. that led to relationships and building relationships that bring you business. Right, right. right. Um, it's a huge relationship driven type of an organization, mm -hmm. obviously. Mm -hmm. um, talk a little bit about Cornet and sure. kind of you know, shameless plug for the Chicago you know, chapter of Cornet, but sure. maybe about the golf outing and Kind of what we've been able to do and yeah well what i've always found it's interesting and different about cornet is is that you know i say i would say this tongue-in-cheek like it's, at its core um it's a networking association sure. it doesn't it doesn't pretend to be some sort of you know uh, we're the facility managers training ground type thing i mean yes they have a fantastic educational platform their mcr program is second to none mm -hmm. it's where i've met some of the greatest people i have some of my greatest clients directly out of taking those classes like i can line of sight like i work with these guys because i met them in you know fort lauderdale six years so ago. deals get done because of your affiliation with Cornet. they they do um, but it's again, it goes back to it's the relationship, mm -hmm. um, and people want to work with people they like, of course. And so it takes time to build those relationships and things like that. And frankly, I mean, I think that a lot of people get um, kind of short burned out in Cornet because they come in and they're like, oh, I hear about all these great companies, like whatever else, and they're in it for six, 
six months and they're like, oh, well, I haven't got any deals out of this. Right. It's a long burn association yeah, and yeah, people yeah. do respect and see the value of, of, of the time you put in. And I'm going to use a perfect example is this guy by the name of Rich Wagner, who a uh, big senior guy with AT&T. Mm-hmm. Got to know Rich. He was kind of in and out of part of the board and that sort of stuff and just happened to get a chance to play golf with him at the, one of the events somewhere in Arizona or something like that. And, you know, I'm always just you know, being a nice guy, get to know you, know about you, your family, what you do, your job, people you work with, that sort of thing. And and uh, so I was paying for golf that day. And uh, I, I love this story because he's about 14th tee. He turns to me and says, okay, John, I know this isn't free, so what is it that you need? I love it. <laughs> and I said, well, you know, I'm focused on the facility management. He said, let me introduce you to my guy, Alvarez. He said, you guys will hit it off great. Right. You know, I can't tell you if there's anything directly there, but at least let me facilitate that. Well, it's on you. Right. You know. Yeah. And it gives you the chance to, you know, to do that. The second thing is, is, is truly, and I, this is another one of my favorite stories to tell is, is I always talk about, you know, just starting a business. I didn't know any, I didn't know anybody. I didn't know anything about the business. And I went to my, one of my first corner lunches and there was the global head of real estate speaking here in Chicago. Uh, for Hewlett Packard. Mm-hmm. Hewlett Packard was a lot bigger deal back then than it is now. Of course, yeah. um, but you know, the next meeting I'm in, uh, I'm sitting there and all the construction guys are doing their construction stuff and the, the client asked a question about like, what are other companies doing in terms of their workplace and things like that? And I immediately, you know, light bulb went off and I took my chance and I said, you know, I just saw this presentation from the global head of real estate at Hewlett Packard and they got to physically like change his statue. He's like, You're such a name doctor. He's like, he's like, he's like <laughs> where, where did you hear that? You know, like whatever yeah, else. And yeah. let me tell you about this, you know, this journey that they've gone on. And, and I'm not saying it's perfect for you guys, but it's the same sort of thing that we're going to you know, ride along with you to do. And it's just that sort of thing to be able to kind of be a sponge and absorb that stuff. Yeah. For me at that time in particular, it was just, I didn't know any, I mean, I needed to learn all this stuff. I didn't know what workplace even meant. Yeah. I didn't. You know, I didn't know what portfolio optimization or, you know, I didn't, I didn't know what any of these. No, but you, you, you had, you had had, um, before you came to Resport, that, that type of mindset training to be connecting those dots. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And that's probably what has gotten you through into where you are now. Sure. Still doing that same thing. Yeah. Oh, hey, guess I just heard this. Yeah. This may be pertinent to what you're saying. Yep. Right. Just connecting those dots. Yep. And it's the one thing that um, you know. I, I, I really. It's really weird to do this today because I sat on this panel yesterday. I had to talk about myself yesterday. I had to talk about myself today, which is weird. I don't. I typically don't like talking about myself, and it makes me uncomfortable. And um, pumping your own tires. Yeah. yeah. But, but, but somebody said to me. They said that this. Maybe you know. Maybe it was even you said this. Is that you know the one thing is your one of your greatest strengths is just being a connector. Yeah. And I you know, listen. I've connected people all over this globe to do things and deals and programs and sure. whatever else. And some have happened. Some haven't happened. But it's just. Um, it's just what they've said. You know, you're one of the greatest connectors of people. Um, and it's you know not always because I see a deal or I necessarily see something, but I see you know an opportunity for two people, either you know, like minds or common interests and things like that that should you know should get to know each other. I'll take credit for that one. That's probably <laughs> me. That's something too. <laughs> and, and truthfully, I mean it's funny. Like I get I get text messages and it'll be people who are in Arizona. Uh, hey, do you know? Yeah, connecting with yeah, uh, of course. connecting with uh, you know but you know people. Like, hey, look who I'm hanging out with. You know that sort of stuff. And yeah. and I just I, I love that. But one of the other I'm telling a lot of stories, but. Oh, one of the other ones was I get a text message and it is probably 10, 11 o'clock our time. So Germany seven, six, seven hours ahead of us. Mm-hmm. And it's three or four of like my best friends from all over the country, one from Kansas City, one from the Quad Cities, one from Chicago, all partying at a corner event in, in Berlin. Right. At like at like two a.m. Right. You're <laughs> like yeah. You know like but it's just you know that, that's that's one of the things I just love about the business and that's like an intangible Surprise to me. Surprised you weren't there. Yeah, I know, right? Uh, not that time. Uh, but anyway, so um, I digress. We were talking about contractors and things like that, and, and back to you know that sort of thing. Uh, oh no, we were on Cornet. We were on Cornet. You can go back to contractors. No, 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 I got it. I, we'll, we'll, we'll get around. Near and dear to my heart. Um, you know the other thing about um, Cornet that has really been beneficial to me is 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 the golf eye. Um, it was a special skill set. That's what I did, bef- you know, for ten years working at a country club and things like that. And so it's just been a no brainer. Um, and, and it's really that was something that I heard somebody say one time. You should have one event that is your kind of give back, right. and one big kind of thing you do every year. Right. Just you know, that's just something you should do. And it's a blowout, man. <laughs> it is. Well, fortunately, I've got great people yeah. like yourself uh, involved, and so we've got it. Uh, we've got some of it on autopilot now. Uh, we got a great venue and right. things like that yeah. that works well. So we can do we can tweak some things. And we can do some other fun stuff with it. But 
Um, you know, I've, I've now really settled into that approach just in corn and in general. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not just a golf outing. Because yeah. my wife said to me the other day, and she's fantastic about call, calling me out. She says, God, you get so frustrated sometimes, and you know, you're, you're so fired up about this, and this is just corn it, you know, like whatever. Yeah. And I took a long pause, and I and she, she kind of said, do you really need to do this? And I took a long pause, and I thought about it, and I said, you know what? Corn it as a whole, golf outing, you know, all sorts of stuff. That is my give back to the industry. Right. And truthfully, I haven't, I've got great relationships with people. I haven't had like clear direct line of sight since I've been a broker to a deal per se. Sure. Um, but there's a lot of intangibles around that. And yeah. I've got some of my best friends from across the country um, that I talk to on a weekly basis uh, about just, you know, random BS. Yeah. Um, and I have, you know, my wife. <laughs> purely because of Cornet, so um, you know, I owe a lot to that. But now there's other great organizations out there too. I'm also heavily involved in another one called IAMC, mm -hmm. uh, which is more industrial focused, um, but it's a real small kind of family style, yeah. uh, very limited kind of access. That serves, that serves specifically to the industrial sector. They're focused in industrial manufacturing, but I'd argue that most of the people from a, from like a corporate real estate side that are involved there are actually more like they manage like the headquarters for Kellogg's. Sure. Um, so so there's you know that's going to kind of touch everybody. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Cause I mean, you know, listen, you you can say you're an industrial company, but you have an office somewhere. Of course. It's snapped down in the front of a building somewhere yeah, or whatever else. So. Um, and, and like I said, I like that organization just from its, uh, its, its you know, they, their events, they don't allow for business cards. It's truly about getting to know people. Right. Um, which clearly, as everything I've said today, fits, you know, fits with me. Uh, so Relationships, man. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, I know that when, when uh, you know, we're connecting dots in-house in on uh, potential projects and things, it's always, you know, it's a who do you know, mm -hmm. you know, kind of thing. Um, so you're one of those guys. I call. Hey, you got a guy. <laughs> you and a handful of others. You got a guy. Yeah. You know? uh, so, coming full circle now. Mm -hmm. What does the future hold for for John Whitman? So, um, future holds a couple of things. Um, one is is to continue to drive um, the what I've described as our business model, which is really focused in mid cap type of companies mm -hmm. and where we can help them. Um, doesn't matter what what that means. Uh, it can be anything. Um, yeah, some things with real estate. Maybe it's to do with their incentives and negotiations with a city or state or something like that. Um, and then it's to to expand into knowing different things and different aspects of what we do. Listen, I know very little to nothing about like what capital markets even means. Right. Um, we have a massive group of people that do capital markets type stuff. So I think it's um, it's to continue to kind of round out our uh, offering in that aspect. Um, we are very blessed. We've just been hired to help rep some property for a couple of our companies, mm -hmm. which is not in our. It's not you know if you look at our kind of business plan, it's not in our wheelhouse. But the principles are the same of what we've been talking about. It's being able to take uh, the relationships we have uh, and you know make people aware. Uh, of, of you know opportunities yeah and uh, so I'm excited about that because it kind of gets my creative juices flowing a little bit you know we're gonna do some drone videos we're gonna make yeah, some websites and, and yeah. we're gonna do some marketing things and, right, right you know uh, one of the companies is uh, uh, utility and they've mentioned they have a private jet uh, Fuel the jet. and they have mentioned that they have tickets to the 2020 Ryder Cup so, so, is that cool? <laughs> Gus, <how are> that? <laughs> is that cool? definitely it goes it definitely goes, goes to Kohler definitely goes to Kohler um, so it's it's you know um, we and, and this is something our group got together at the uh, end of last year and said what are we going to do to diversify? Yeah, because um, you know as I said, there's clients the, demand more. Clients demand more, and when somebody comes to you and says, "Can you do this?" Yes. To yes, I, I was supposed to get that answer out before you even got the question finished. Yes. <laughs> just, just I got a great friend of mine, a mentor, who always just said, "Just, John, just say yes and be agreeable. Yeah. Like that, that's all it takes. Right. Like you know, and then figure it out. Figure it out. Find the right people and figure it out. I mean, that's uh, it's so amazing how how difficult it is for some folks. But um, so you know, what does the future hold? I think there's that aspect of it. I think it's kind of rounding that thing out. Mm -hmm. I think it's just continuing to improve our process. Um, I think we're unique. There's not a lot of groups even within the business in general that do what we do. Sure. Um, because listen, frankly, I mean, we talk with guys all the time. 
and, and, and sorry, local brokers, for if you're listening, to this, local brokers will say, I want to, you know, I want to do more multi-market business, and then you say, Do you really want to work twice as hard? And do you really want to make half as less, half as much money? I forgot the question. Yeah. And like, oh, okay, I'm gonna go back to, I'm gonna go back to, you know, making my, making a big fee and hit and, run, and, hit and, run, and, hit and beating it. And listen, maybe it's not working hard, but it's just being a master of your local market. Of course. Um, yeah. We've got to be generalists because we've got to be a master of, of a lot of markets. Yeah. Um, but we got to be able to go and really show our clients that we can, you know, know those marketplaces. Mm-hmm. And listen, when we find somebody who doesn't. You know, maybe falsely represents their knowledge. It's it's damaging to us. Yeah. Um, so we we really have a high level of trust and reliability on those folks. So I think it's you know it's continuing to just kind of you know drive that that side of it. Um, and then like I said, maybe find some of these other aspects of like, you know repping some property or things like that, and and doing some of these other things that uh, that uh, will probably be what the future holds. That's outstanding. Yeah. Uh, well, hopefully we got all the audio together. <laughs> uh, I want to thank you for your time, my friend. Uh, my pleasure for our first attempt at uh, at shop talk. It's fantastic. It's well, let's just hope the recording worked. And otherwise, well, otherwise, we'll be back here tomorrow doing this all over again. This is the kind of conversations that you and I have regularly, anyways. Yeah. <laughs> so, just press the record button. Yeah, I don't know about so much about that, but uh, mm-hmm. thanks for being here, Tom. Thanks for having me. Yeah, we really appreciate it. Pleasure. Um, shop talk. Ever ever want to come back again? Uh, we can we can shamelessly plug anything you want to plug. No, no, just uh, right, just buy LCI. That's all I got to sell. Everybody. Buy LCI. Buy, buy LCI. Thanks, uh, you guys are a great firm and appreciate the opportunity. All right, thanks, dude. Yeah.